I remember uh, not too long ago watching a, a pastor give a sermon, and there was just something about the way he was moving and speaking that was just like, okay, he's sensing the anointing of the Lord, and he just wants to be careful not to go outside of it, you know, and and I've noticed that in my own, and it's not like this in a totally inhibited life. It's not like fear or whatever. It's just like being in the flow, right? And just wanting to, to stay there, wanting to be, uh, still not right. And, and just, all right, that probably was not of the spirit. But, um, what the, all right, here we go. All right. And by the way, I want to stop calling it OCD. If we could call it CDO and put it in alphabetical order, that would be nice. <laughs> All right, so. So, um, but yeah, just wanting to be in the flow of the Spirit, to not go outside of that flow. And, and you know, that's what the way our lives should be, right? And it's not like it's overly um, careful and weighing every word, and, but it's just, Lord, I want to be aware of your presence at all times. I want to flow in, in your presence. And, um, and I'm finding out that that can be done outside of the congregation. You know, that can be done when I'm teaching my students at the public school. That can be done in my home. And, um, uh, and, and I'm working on that, you know, and the Lord's working on me on that. Um, I want to read this from Colossians. This is Colossians chapter 1. It's a beautiful praise hymn of Yeshua, starting at verse 15. He, talking about Yeshua, is the, in, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen, whether thrones or angelic powers or rulers or authorities, all was created through him and for him. He exists before everything, and in him all holds together. He is the head of the body, his ecclesia, his community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. It's such a strong testimony to the centrality of Yeshua in our faith, right? He's before all things. All things are heading towards him. He's the reconciler of all things. He is the preeminent of all things. He's the head of his body, us, right? And that's been one of my... Um, concerns and one of the things I've been careful to emphasize and re-emphasize is the centrality of Yeshua and how we need this spirit to keep us there because it's so easy to get off focus on that and I, I've seen it time and time again and sometimes maybe some people think well you're preaching the same thing too often right but what does Paul say says it's safe for me, right, to say it's, it's good for you, it's safe to, to kind of reemphasize sometimes some of the same things. I feel that is one of my jobs here, is not just to always give new information and new insights, but to keep us safe, right? I do the, the same thing with my students at the school. All right, we're going on to new material, but first we're going to review the old stuff. Do you really have that down? Do we really know what it means to have Yeshua as the head of our faith, as the foundation of our faith, right? Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, no other foundation can be laid other than Yeshua. He's the foundation. He's the head. All things are held together in him. He is before all things. All things are, uh, what does it say here? Uh, all was created through him and for him, right? Somehow all of creation is for him. And so we have to emphasize this. What does that mean? It means tremendous things. 
You know, it, it really has a tremendous effect on our faith, on the way we live. I am so blessed. I was just thinking about this the other day. <clears throat> some of you, got, some of you have been with me a long time. You know, Wendy, you've been with the congregation a long time, and Kevin, a long time, and Dita, who's um, not here today, a long time, and and you've been faithful. And I think that the reason you've been faithful to the congregation is because you understand the congregation is faithful to Yeshua, right? That, that we're not going to get off on tangents, at least not for long, until somebody pulls us back, till the Spirit pulls us back. Uh, and, and I've seen those tangents time and time again. And, uh, and, and the question is, is why? Why does Yeshua become less than sufficient for us? You know, that's a question I've often wrestled with. Why, you know, some people come here, and some people have come here for the wrong motives, and they found the right motive, and they've stayed, and that's been a blessing, you know? What, what were the wrong motives? Well, sometimes, like I, I say, sometimes it's anger. Anger at the church, right? The church isn't getting it right. We hate the church. That I was hurt at a church, and so if I come to a messianic synagogue, then all of a sudden I can find what's right in a new uh, form and, and have an even higher ground from which to judge the church. Or, the, or uh, it's that I've got to find the right day to worship. We're not doing it on the real Sabbath. I need to find the real Sabbath. Or I need to find the real connection with the the laws of God, and so forth. Those are, those are, the, those are wrong motives. I'm just going to say, it's just, it's the wrong motive, okay? Perhaps you could say something like this. I want to glorify Yeshua more fully, and the Lord is leading me to do it through a closer connection with Israel and with God's given instruction to Israel. That's, the, that's a fine motive. As long as it's Yeshua, right? It's not the laws or something apart from him, right? Well, I have Yeshua, but I also need the laws. That's wrong. I have Yeshua, but I also need the right Sabbath. That's wrong. I have Yeshua, but I also need anything else. It's wrong have Yeshua. I want to glorify Yeshua in the way the Spirit is leading me to glorify Yeshua. And there's something about connecting with the Passover or with the seventh day Sabbath that's helping me keep him central. That's good, right? That's pure. Or, or not. The Lord's leading me to glorify Yeshua in my Sunday church. Fine. But if, if he's not central, if we're not living Colossians chapter 1, then we've got a problem and we're off base. Genesis chapter 24, and I'm going to bring all this uh, back around. Um, so, so hang in there with me. We're going to take a left turn here, but come back around. Genesis chapter 24. This is one of the, it may be the longest chapter in Genesis. Well, there's some other long ones too, but it's, it's one of the longer chapters in Genesis. And it almost at first glance seems like a lot of space for something that could have been summed up real quickly and maybe doesn't, it doesn't even matter that much. At first glance, it might seem like that. This is Abraham calling his servant, um, probably Eliezer, although he's not specifically named in this chapter, calling his servant to himself and saying, go find a wife for my son Isaac. You can't find him amongst the, you can't find him a wife amongst the Canaanite women. And we, we might ask why, why not among the Canaanites? Well, uh, Maybe it has something to do with their idolatrous practices, although there's nothing for sure about Abraham's family back, at, uh, back in Mesopotamia that were, uh, were they idol worshipers? We read later on about Laban's idols and how 
Jacob's wife, Rachel, steals the idols. Right? Remember that story? So he's going to Laban, who apparently is an idol worshiper, to find a wife for Isaac. So why does he have to go to Laban? Why does he have to go to, um, to Abraham's family back in Mesopotamia, where Abraham came from? If, if we're not too worried about idol worshiping, maybe you know, we can take some leadership here and say, no, those are wrong. Uh, we're to worship the one true God. Why not a Canaanite woman? And the answer is probably that God is wanting Abraham and his family to remain distinct from the Canaanites. You're not of the same people, right? I, I'm actually going to displace them and give this land to you. If it looks too combined together, if it looks too, uh, there's no true distinction between you and the Canaanites, then um, the testimony is dead. See that you don't go, see that you don't send my son away. He's got to stay here. You go get him a wife from there and you bring her back. Swear to me. And so the servant swears. I'll do this. If the woman doesn't won't come back with me, I'm free from the oath. But I am going to go there and find a wife for your son, Isaac. And then miraculous things happen, right? Amazing things happen. He goes to, uh, he goes to Mesopotamia. Let me uh, read his prayer. And by the way, here's a, a map. Um, and uh, uh, here's the uh, Mediterranean Sea out here. I mean, we've got Egypt, and, and they're somewhere down here in the south of Israel, and they've got to travel about 500 miles, uh, just lost my glasses, up to Aram Naharaim, which is probably somewhere up here, nobody's 100% sure, but somewhere up in there, that's about 500 miles a car trip of 500 miles for me at my age is tough. I don't like it anymore. Uh, I used to find it adventurous, and now two or three miles in, it's like, can we stop and rest somewhere? Uh, but they've got to do 500 miles on camels through uh, all kinds of hills and mountains and in, uh, in, in, in desert area. And so uh, this, is, this is a major trek. <clears throat> but he gets there... <clears throat> And um, and he he comes to a well when he arrives, and he says this prayer, uh, Genesis twenty four verse twelve, Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master. He said, please make something happen before me today and show loyalty to Abraham, my master. Look, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are going out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please tip your jar so that I may drink, and she will say, drink, and I'll also water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So by this I'll know that you have shown graciousness to my master. <clears throat> this is, by the way, the first prayer for guidance that we have in the Bible. And it's, it says a lot, right? It says... Uh, it says that you exist before God as an individual and not just a part of a community, right? It's a, it's a powerful prayer. The fact that God answers it is powerful. I'm going to fiddle with this phone all day. I'm so sorry. There we go. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so he says this prayer, and you probably know the story, Exactly what he prays happens. Now, before he had finished speaking, behold, there was Rivka, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Going out with her jar on her shoulder, now the young woman was very good looking, a, a girl of marriageable age, uh, and she was a virgin. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me sip a little water for your jar. 
So she said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly lowered her jar into her hand and gave him a drink. Now, when she finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll also draw water for your camels until they've finished drinking. It was expected that if a stranger asks you for water, you give them water. It's unusual to offer water to the camels as well, right? She goes out of her way. And this is a lot of water. After a trek like that, um, the, the, the resources I read said, you know, those camels, I forget what they said, like 20 gallons each or something like that. And the jar she had probably was about three gallons. This is a major job, watering those camels. So she quickly poured out water into her jug, into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew water for all his camels, while the man continued to pay close attention to her, keeping silent in order to know whether or not Adonai had made his way successful. Now after the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a nose ring of gold, weighing a half shekel and two bracelets on her hands, weighing ten shekels of gold. Whose daughter are you, he said. Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She also said to him, there's both straw and plenty of feed with us, as well as room to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshipped Adonai, and he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loyalty and his truth toward my master. As for me, Adonai has guided me in the way of the house of my master's brothers. Then you know the story, right? She takes them back. To, well, Laban comes out, meets them. They go back to the house. The servant recounts the whole story again. Now, I've mentioned before, the Bible is very terse, very sparse of words, generally speaking. If we were to go back to Genesis chapter 12, where God calls Abram to the land that I will give you, it's, we don't get like this great adventure narrative, do we? We don't get like any details at all. Come to this land, okay. Well, somebody died on the way. We kept going. There we are, right? There we are. But here we get a whole chapter, and it's not even centered on Abraham. It's centered in on Rebekah. And we get the story twice because we just read this. We read the story in the beginning of chapter 24. Here's everything that happened. And then we get to Laban's house and the servant said, I'm not going to eat until I tell you everything that happens. And then he tells you everything that happens. It's like some people's sermons, right? Here's what happened. And then here's what happened again. It's like, why so much space on this? Why, why so much space on this? Well, because Rebecca's important, right? Rebecca's an important part of the narrative, just like Sarah was an important part of the narrative. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless your son. He's going to be the one who receives the covenant. And Abraham says, I already have a son. His name is Ishmael. No, it's got to be through Sarah. The woman's important. Right? The narrative has to take place through Sarah. That's the one who received the promise. Not just Abraham, but Abraham and Sarah. They received the promise. There's Isaac, according to promise, miraculously so, after the way of women had departed from her. Here as well, this big, long narrative over finding somebody who's not a Canaanite, and she's going to become now the matriarch. And that's why the chapter ends, verse 67, and Isaac, you know, after she comes back, yes, I'll go. So the servant brings Rebecca back. And then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. This is the new Sarah. This is the new matriarch. This is important. The, the hand of God in this chapter is super evident without it specifically being mentioned, right? It's kind of like, uh, kind of like the book of Esther, right? In the whole book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned. 
right? It's the only book in the Bible without a specific mention of God's name. But these circumstances are set up in such a way that you cannot deny that God is involved, right? Here it doesn't specifically say God did this or God did that, but he did it, you know? God is moving the story along. The pinnacle of the story is Rebecca coming back willingly to become Isaac's wife, taking her place in this family as a matriarch, so that that family of God can continue without becoming overly assimilated with the Canaanites. So that there's a specific people of God where God can show the world his faithfulness, the way he acts with this people can be showing the faithfulness of God to the world. And of course that gets fulfilled in Yeshua, our Messiah. But as far as this story is concerned, it's Rebecca. It's Rebecca taking her place in the family of God. And God acting as the servant and through the servant to move the story along. And what I feel like the Lord wants me to share today is to ask you, are you willing to allow God to be your servant? You know, and that's, that's, I, I wouldn't say that anywhere else, right? I couldn't say that in a Hindu temple or in a Muslim mosque. You know, I, I can't say that in other places, but I can say it here because of the nature of God. Are you willing to let God move your story along? Yes, the story it's a subset of the story, right? The ultimate thing is that God is glorified. The Bible doesn't end with Genesis 24. God is going to be glorified. But this subset of the story is centered in on Isaac and Rebekah. And God is acting as the servant and through the servant, through the circumstances, through the faithfulness of Abraham's servant to bring about Rebekah's story. And to bring about Isaac's story, God has got to be the servant here. John chapter 13. <clears throat> now, it just happened before the feast of Passover, Yeshua knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them until the end. While the Seder meal was happening, the devil had already put in the heart of Judah from Creote that he should hand over Yeshua. Yeshua knew that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he gets up from the meal and lays aside his outer garment and takes a tally, wraps it around his waist. He's, he's doing what a servant would do. Then he pours water into a basin he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel wrapped around him. That's what a servant does. We just read that all the fullness, in Colossians 1, we just read that all the fullness of God dwells in Yeshua, that he is the image of the invisible God. And what does the image of the invisible God do? He takes out his, off his outer garment he wraps a towel around his waist. He bends down to the disciples, down uh, in front of their dirty feet, and he begins to wash their feet. Then he comes to Simon Peter, who says to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Yeshua responded, You don't know what I am doing now, but you will understand after these things. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. You are not going to be my servant. Yeshua answered him, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. If you don't allow me to be your servant in your story, to wash your feet, to walk carefully before me as you see me bringing out 
the circumstances, to move the story along. If you're just going to go your own way rather than seeing how I am serving you and your story, yes, the greater goal, the bigger story is the glorification of the Lord. That your life will glorify him. But that little subset there called your life, that's ultimately geared towards his worship and his praise and his glorification. He wants to work in that little subset of the bigger story called your life to be your servant. But you have to walk carefully like the servant walked carefully. Lord, is this what you're doing here? Let me pray for guidance. Are you working in this situation let me sit back and watch and see if this is you or not let me be like that preacher up on the stage sensing the spirit of god but moving a little carefully i want to make sure i'm staying in the flow and not just going my own way lord are you serving me here are you washing my feet are you arranging the right bride for my master's servant are you sending me on a mission I, if you're sending me on this mission, Lord, let me walk carefully. Because you're in the circumstances. You're in the details. I need to interpret them rightly. I need to be praying rightly. And I need to have a heart that says, Lord, I need you to be my servant. I cannot do this on my own. I do need my feet washed. And you're the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as difficult as it is for me to understand the King of Kings and Lord of Lords washing my feet, it needs to happen. That's what one of the songs was about today, right? I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. How could it be that you, my king, should die for me? How could it be that the king should become the servant? That's what it's about. But he is your servant. But he's your servant towards his end and not yours. Right? We have to keep that in mind. He's going to guide your path if your path is directed towards his goal. What did I read here in Colossians 1? All was created through him and for him. And if your life is directed for him, towards him, he's going to come in and be your servant and help you towards that goal. As soon as you get off of that track, it's no longer for Yeshua. Everything is through him and for him. As soon as your goal is something else, then all of a sudden he can't be the servant to that. You surrender your life to him. You glorify Yeshua. You live in his glory. And then his spirit comes in and serves you through the circumstances, through the guidance, through the word, through the cleansing. And you walk carefully and you pray for guidance like Abraham's servant prayed for guidance. And you sit back and you watch, is this what the Lord is doing? Is this the way I should go? Has the Lord blessed my plans in this way? Have my plans themselves been submitted to him? Ah, look at this. Miracle after miracle, right? I prayed she'd water the camels. That's unusual, but she's watering the camels. I see God's hand in that. And then I move forward. Lord God Almighty, Give us, give us that spirit, Lord. First of all, we've got to have a path and a goal and a heart where our main desire is for you to be glorified. This is not a love story about Isaac and Rebecca. It's a story about the family of God chosen for God's glory showing that God could reveal his heart to them and through them. The end of the story is not Genesis 24. The story continues. Continues on to King David, continues on to Solomon, continues on to Yeshua, continues on to his death and to his resurrection, continues on to his 
return in glory. This is the story, but that little subset of the story, that, that link in the chain called Isaac and Rebekah, Lord, you put it together. You moved, and you moved behind the scenes, and you put the circumstances together, and you blessed the servant's travels, and you moved through the servant, and you answered the servant's prayer, and the servant, Lord, is an example for us. Let me pray, and then sit back and watch, and then move carefully. And now that I see the Lord's will, I am going to move on and move forward in that. So, Lord, help us to live that way, allowing you to serve us, allowing you to cleanse our feet, allowing you to put the circumstances together as we move prayerfully and carefully, not to go before you, not to lag behind you, but to move right in step with your spirit so that you might be glorified so that our life might be fulfilled, the purpose of our life fulfilled to bring you glory. In Yeshua's name.